Dr. Tillich, do you think that this universe is a hospitable environment for man? Do you think that it's uh, hostile or helpful or neutral towards man's well-being and fulfillment? I would perhaps not say the universe, but I would say the ground of the universe, the deepest dimension of the universe, which we call the holy or the divine. That is on the side of man, of his realization. But as a mother has to be, if the child tears away from her and turns against her, then the reaction of the mother is accordingly negative. For the sake of something positive, but first negative. Does this mean that the universe uh, exacts demands of man and inflicts consequences if these demands are not met? Yes, that's And in this sense it has a justice, an order of justice in it? Oh, certainly, uh, and uh, that's what I believe. Do you think then that life in its ultimate character is as it should be? No, on the contrary. I think that Life has elements of that in it as it should be, and other elements of what it should not be. And these two elements are always mixed. Is it right and just that human life have this mixed character? It is in any case a fact, and it's the first fact which we see and experience under which we suffer and which at the same time gives us our greatness, our dignity. When we look at this mixed character, there are some uh, ennobling elements and some conflicting elements. Is it possible to give weight to one over the other? Oh, or? certainly. And uh, I would think that this is the meaning of all religions and in a very special sense of Christianity that uh, healing powers are in the world which come out of the deepest depths of the world and which makes it possible that this split of which I spoke, this estrangement of our being from what we ought to be, doesn't destroy us. If these healing powers were not in the world, everywhere, in nature and man, but especially in human history. Human history already would have destroyed itself completely. You speak of the universe as just. Would you say that it is also loving? Yes, I would even say that whatever we say about what I call the ground of being is uh, the central concept, always must be love. Well, in what sense is love a appropriate word for reading? I think in every sense. If you want a definition that's very questionable whether one should give one for love, then I would say it is the urge towards the reunion of the separated. And I think all life process have this character. Everywhere I observe this. The desire for the reunion of the separated. And this means that the ground of our being uh, desires the reunion of ourselves with it? With uh, ourselves, with it, with the, all the other beings, and what probably is the most difficult, with ourselves. Nothing is more difficult than to be reconciled with oneself. The ground of our being is this a synonym for our word God? Yes, it's uh, not a synonym. It uh, emphasizes one element in the much richer idea of God, but uh, the basic element, the fundamental element. In this sense, you are right. Uh, it is then spiritual in character? Yes. What uh, would this mean? Now, what this means that the ground of our being cannot be understood in terms of a physical process, like atomic process or power field processes or even biological 
processes, but it must be understood in analogy to our own spiritual life. Is the basic element in our spiritual life our self-consciousness? And if so, does God's spirituality mean that he too is self-conscious and that he knows each one of us? Now you have asked me a question which is the most difficult to answer and with which I am most bothered well, because I'd love of my hear. idea of the ground of being. Yeah. But uh, let me say it so, that which we encounter as the holy, as a matter of our ultimate concern, cannot be less than we. Therefore, we must say that it is personal. But we also must say that it's more than we, that it's suprapersonal. So this question cannot be answered so easily. You cannot say he is person or he is not person. You must always give the answer he is personal and suprapersonal at the same time because he is the ground of everything personal. But what this would mean, this uh, suprapersonal, this uh, staggers our imagination. Is this what you, you're saying? You express it in very good words. But this much at least your words say to me, that this environment in which our lives are set is not ultimately a mechanical one of dead matter and blind forces. Would this be true? That would very much be true. Do you think that man is the lord of nature? Now this uh, is uh, a little bit dangerous because out of this lordship so much mistreatment of nature has followed that I sometimes feel we should more emphasize our unity with nature. And I feel that especially in this country where the Calvinistic uh, a little bit moralistic attitude have removed nature so far from men that uh, many people are not able to f see the divine in the ground of nature as they see it in themselves. Do you feel yourself uh, attuned to, uh, in kinship with nature? Oh, you express it much better than I could. These <laughs> words are wonderful. Attuned to and in kinship with. That's just what I wanted to say. What about history? Do you think that history is under the power of a being that knows what it's doing and uh, uses its power to achieve its ends in history? Yes, I believe in what I would call historical providence. I believe that whatever happens in history contributes to an ultimate meaning. And that this is the uh, divine power in the ground of history which contributes in every moment of our historical ex uh, existence to uh, an ultimate meaning. In this sense, I see history, but I don't see it as a word providence often means as a preconceived plan of a heavenly tyrant which now runs on and everything happens as it was preconceived. I believe that uh, there is a continuous creation of the new in history through every creature and especially through men. But this creative ground of all this is, again, the divine ground. Is there direct intervention into history by uh, God? I wouldn't say such a thing. Because the word intervention uh, has for me, gives to me the impression that uh, God has uh, to destroy what he has first created because every intervention is a destruction of a process which otherwise would have run on differently and in this for this reason i don't like this uh, word intervention at all but i would say uh, creative directing in every moment 
but not intervention in some moments. Dr. Tillich, what is the highest good that man's life can achieve? To become real what he is potential. Well, to let's... bring into reality the powers which are given to him. Is it obvious what we mean by the realization of our potentialities? And does this mean the same thing for all people? I believe that every human being has something even often very hiddenly in the corner of his soul, which is sacred to him. I never have found a human being to whom nothing is sacred, even if it is the cynical desire to have nothing sacred, then this desire is sacred to him. So you cannot escape what I call ultimate concern. The only question is, which concrete thing is the bearer of his ultimate concern? And there are all the differences of religion and what we call today quasi-religion as political systems occur. The ultimate concerns are different. And here I make the difference between the authentic and unauthentic expressions of it, those which are really genuinely born out of an ultimate concern, and those who are only taken and have lost any power over the man. And I make another distinction, which is perhaps more profound in this respect, namely the distinction between the divine and the demonic forms of ultimate concern. What makes an ultimate concern demonic? Uh, the destructive character, and perhaps I could go even more sharply to your point, saying uh, if it is against justice and truth. And it was very interesting to observe when I observed the development towards Nazism in the 20th, before I was thrown out, how they started with the destruction of justice against everybody else, except against their own movement, and with truth. Truth is what must be said in order to keep the ruling group in power, namely themselves. It would seem then that whatever else human fulfillment involves, it must at least conform to the structures of justice and truth. And truth. Yes. And We've been talking about uh, human fulfillment. Why do we fall so far short of it? We fall away from what we could be, namely united in love through justice and truth, because we want to draw the whole world into ourselves and our finite reality. And this is the old doctrine of the paradise story. You will be like God. That's the temptation. Do you think that all the meaning our lives may have is to be found within our present lifespan? What I'm asking, I suppose, is whether there's life after death. Yes, and I would uh, add, you also ask whether there was life before birth. I suppose I am. And these two yes. things always should seem together. Yes. Now, you know that in the Indian theology for many centuries, perhaps millennia, this doctrine of the reincarnation in different forms through the whole process of time is one of the central uh, tenets of this, of this uh, religion. We don't have that in Christianity. I myself am doubtful how to deal with it. Uh, we cannot say that the life process of a child which died before it became one year old, or a feeble-minded, or even a man who comes out of uh, bad con uh, surroundings and never found 
much of the actualization of his life, is now finished in eternity. Uh, you I, say we cannot we say We cannot this. say that. I really feel uh, there is a kind of gap in Christian thinking. In uh, Roman Catholicism, there is a doctrine of the purgatory, which does in some way a similar thing. Yes. But uh, in Protestantism, this has never been taken very seriously. And so I am now in a, a difficult situation with your question, but I can only tell you that I see the lack of an answer to this question in Protestant Christianity. This is my first answer to it. I simply must confess something of ignorance about this. cannot simply accept the Indian doctrine. I cannot accept the Catholic doctrine. But I cannot uh, retire to the traditional Protestant doctrine. So here we are before a problem. And it's my hope that in the encounter of religion, Perhaps Christianity will do what it did once when it encountered the Oriental religions, the, 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 which existed in the Roman Empire, and the Greek religion, yeah. the Greek philosophy, taking in a lot of it. Perhaps we can take in something from, from India just on this point. Very good. Let, let me now come back to this idea of reconciliation or acceptance. It's a key notion in your idea of human fulfillment. What does it involve? Everybody has a hidden hostility against his own being. We are hostile against other human beings, even if we believe we love them. We are hostile towards the ground of our being. We are afraid of the inner judgment, which is connected with the principle of justice and love. And so, we need this kind of reconciliation. Now the main impediment against the feeling of reconciliation is uh, that we feel judged, that we feel rejected, condemned, or however you express it. And therefore, the first and basic step in the process of reconciliation is that we get the feeling we are accepted. And I like to express that in the little bit paradoxical phrase, accept that you are accepted in spite of being unacceptable. That's uh, the summary of my theology in this respect. And this means that uh, though there are drives, tendencies within us which lead to consequences which we could interpret as standing judgment upon us, uh, there is at the same time uh, a power uh, which, despite all that we do, works in our behalf towards uh, healing. Yes, towards healing, and we have now again the very interesting fact that theology has learned a lot from psychotherapy. The good psychotherapist accepts the patient and doesn't uh, put moral demands upon him. He doesn't say, don't drink, but he say, I know you are drinking too much, so let's see where it comes from. You are my friend, we all are in the same boat. I also am judged in many respects, but in any case, I accept you, I hope you can accept me. And now let's go on and find out what the background of this is. Now this kind of medicine has taught the ministers of today quite a lot. Namely, that they shall do what they always speak of, namely the good news. The good news is not that one shall be good, but the good news is that one can be good although one is not good. Dr. Tillich, if the human race should destroy itself by blowing up this planet, would this have any bearing at all on the meaningfulness of life? I'm very glad you bring this question out of the mere individualistic discussion we had up to this moment to the society and to history. 
Uh, my answer to your question is definitively no. Uh, the meaning of history doesn't lie in any uh, imagined future in history itself, but it lies in what is created in every moment of the historical process and has its fulfillment in eternity, and eternity is something else than endless time. Here and now, history fulfills itself. For instance, in our talks in this moment, this is history, and this is the beginning and the end also of this moment of history. But uh, to think uh, if history goes on a few thousand years longer, uh, that then the meaning of history is more obvious, is fantastic in my mind. In my mind. Uh, I believe that if history is not fulfilled in every moment, it's not fulfilled at all. I want to read to you one of your sentences. You say that uh, all is vanity, yet through this vanity, eternity shines through to us. What does this mean? This means even if we are in the feeling that life has not much meaning, we spoke about that yes. just a moment yes. ago, that uh, if we take this question of meaning seriously, then in the very seriousness of our question, the ultimate meaning is still present. That we can say, why do you take this so seriously? Because this is for what I am here. This is my question of to be or not to be. This is the question of life and death for me. And even if I know no answer, if I don't know any answer whatsoever, the seriousness of my question is the manifestation that I still have my ultimate concern and have the meaning of my life. If there really were no meaning, it would be impossible to take the question of whether there is seriousness. Exactly. The, every question presupposes an answer which already has been received out of an answer you ask questions. And then you get perhaps more answers, perhaps not. But this answer which is preceding the question is that element of meaning which shines through the vanity vanitatum.